I will uh, present my work from my postdoc at the National Oceanography Center, and I will be talking about accumulation of ambient phosphate in the periplasm of marine cyanobacteria. I'll first present you the current understanding of phosphate uptake, and I'll show you that there are problems with it. I'll then present you our experimental model who we're working with, our questions and findings, and finally, I'll present you uh, with the new proposed model for phosphate uptake in uh, marine cyanobacteria. Why phosphate? Well, phosphorus is one of the essential micro micronutrients for any living organism because uh, our nucleic acids and our phospholipids, they all contain phosphorus. And phosphate is the inorganic form, the most common inorganic form of phosphorus. It comes from the terrestrial realm. Uh, it gets weathered from uh, rocks then it gets transported with streams into the coastal ocean and open ocean. The high seas, they receive a phosphate with aeolian dust brought uh, to them from deserts. Availability of phosphate can control productivity of the whole ecosystem. And the good example of this is the North Atlantic subtropical gyre, uh, where uh, waters are depleted with phosphorus. Here is the false color image of chlorophyll distribution in the Northern Atlantic. You see the Greenland here and Americas and uh, Europe and Africa. Israel is somewhere here. And you see this bluish area and blue is the low concentration of chlorophyll. The higher the chlorophyll, the greener or then warmer the color. And blue is the very low concentration of chlorophyll in this area called the North Atlantic Subtropical Gyre. And this is because not enough phosphorus is in there. Some phosphorus does arrive from Sahara and you see here enrichment with chlorophyll. But this area is quite poor and phosphorus availability actually controls the system. And this is also our playground for our studies. And water over there, when I say blue, this is a false color, but it's also the real color of the water. When you look from the boat at the water at the English Channel, for example, this is how the water looks like. It's greenish. And this is how the water looks here. So it's actually the blue oligotrophic ocean deplete of phosphorus, and that's why the plate of cyanobacteria. In the ocean, you have uh, mainly uh, planktonic bacteria dispersed in the water column. And bacteria, including cyanobacteria, are those that control phosphorus in that area. So not eukaryotes, not multicellular organisms, but bacteria. And who are these bacteria? This is the dot plot of a bacterial plankton from the ocean. Uh, you have side scatter and rain fluorescence. So bacteria are stained with their nucleic stain, so DNA versus size. And there are several major populations. I choose to talk mostly about SAR11 alpha proteobacteria, Prochlorococcus, and Cynococcus cyanobacteria. And here are their images on the left. I try to keep the scale bar adjusted in such a way that you see their relative sizes. All three groups, the SAR11 alpha proteobacteria and the cyanobacteria, the stain gram negative, because they have, in addition to the plasma membrane, which is here on the transmission electron micrograph, shows up a thin dark line labeled with PM. In addition to this, they also have an outer membrane labeled here with OM, and it's very dark because of the presence of lipopolysaccharides which stick out of the cell. In between the two membranes, there is a periplasmic space, and outside the outermost layer is uh, the S layer, uh, the proteinaceous layer, which is present in some, not all gram positive, but also gram negative bacteria. So we know a little bit about their membrane. It will become important in just a second, because when we talk about phosphate and its uptake, we need to think about the outer layers, how phosphate transverses them and reaches the cell itself. So this is my uh, schematic uh, representation of cyanobacterial cell. You have an outer membrane, plasma membrane, and if we look closer, here are all the components, LPS for lipopolysaccharides and S layer, plasmic space and when you have phosphate in the environment it diffuses towards the cell some of it can probably be bound by the lipopolysaccharides and probably the s layer but most of the phosphorus reaches diffuses into the cell through porins you have porins which are specific to anions with the highest specificity to phosphate anions which can be mono duo three anions when phosphorus is inside the periplasm, 
it's taken up actively. If this uptake was passive via diffusion, the next step is active and it uses the PST CAB transporter, which is an ABC type transporter. It has three subunits wedged into the plasma membrane and another one, PSTS, which is dissolved in the periplasm. It travels there and once it meets a phosphate molecule, it catches it, binds it, brings it to the transmembrane units. And using the energy of ATP, phosphate is shuffled inside the cell. And this is the current understanding of the one-step phosphate uptake process. This model can be good for many other nutrients, such as nucleic acids, sugars, nitrate, nitrite, urea. They all work quite similar. You have a point which lets the solute in and then an active uptake. With phosphate, there are several problems. Phosphate is not like other nutrients. And we see it in many publications which are out there. I give you here just three. They call it luxury uptake, surface adsorbed phosphorus, or very rapid opportunistic uptake of phosphate. Something is wrong with phosphate. It does not behave normally. When I was taught, I was said, okay, when you work with phosphorus, be careful. It's very sticky. You cannot remove it. You cannot add it in precise concentration. It's sticky. I'll show you why phosphorus behaves differently from other nutrients in our eyes. We use pulse chase experiments. We take bacteria, for example, oceanic cyanobacteria. We put them in the solution, either artificial one, which is lacking any nutrient we, we are testing, or just in seawater, in oligotrophic areas where the concentration of this nutrient is very low. We spike these cells, we pulse them with these nutrients labeled radioactively. In this example, it's methionine labeled with S35 isotope. We incubate these organisms for an hour with the radioactive methionine. And after that, we dilute, chase this methionine with 1,000 times higher concentration of cold methionine, which is not radioactively labeled. From this point of time, any molecule that the bacterium is taking up the chances that it's radioactive is one to 1,000, right? We diluted it. So the label stops accumulating. So we have the pulse, accumulation of radioactive label, and then the chase, when after the chase, accumulation is halted. There is a tiny increase of approximately 5% after the chase, and this is the intracellular content of this methionine. What I ought to tell you here is that what we are looking at here, what we are testing is the cell macromolecules. We fix cells. So cells leak. Their internal content, it leaks. And this is why we do not see it. So even if they took up a lot of methionine but haven't assimilated it yet, we will not see it. This is only the assimilated material. And when we look at phosphate, the chase doesn't stop its uptake. The accumulation continues and continues and continues. Accumulation of radioactive label as if there is some kind of large intermediate pool, which we call buffer, which exists inside the cell. In the oceanic bacteria, there is no space for much intracellular phosphate granules. So Prochlorococcus, you see, you saw its size. Cyanococcus, normally when you take them from sea, they do not have a polyphosphate granules uh, in oligotrophic ocean. So it should not be from these granules. There is another thing. Uh, here I show you the results from two cruises when we were measuring the uptake rate of methionine in yellow and CO2 fixation in turquoise along the transit. transit. We started in temperate waters, went into the gyre, depleted in phosphorus, and then went outside of the gyre and measured the rates. And as you see, the rates of methionine uptake and CO2 uh, fixation, they are sort of stable. They range within just one order of magnitude. We call it constant. Now, constant rate of methionine uptake reflects the constant rate of protein synthesis and reflects probably the constant growth rate of these bacteria. The same is with CO2. Constant CO2 fixation reflects the constant growth rate of these bacteria. So they grow approximately at the same rate outside and inside the P depleted area. When we measure phosphate uptake though, and here it's two colors for two cruises, the shaded area is inside the gyre, especially this part. And you see that inside the gyre, in the most phosphate deplete area, the uptake rate is the highest, which we thought is counterintuitive. And it's not just higher, it's 15 times higher as compared to the rate in tropical waters.
and the rate is extremely high. Remember the fast opportunistic uptake? Maybe it's part of it. So where do you have phosphorus in your cell? In its nucleic acids and its phospholipids. If you want to divide, you need to double your DNA molecule, right? So the amount of phosphorus taking up within less than three and a half hours is sufficient to build the second copy of DNA in Prochlorococcus in the North Atlantic Tropical Gyre compared to 27 hours outside the gyre where phosphate is much more available. We couldn't understand this, especially we couldn't understand this because they divide only once every three and a half days. Why shall they take phosphorus so quickly and how do they do it? Unclear. But what we know is that phosphate uptake is decoupled from bacterial growth, which is not new. Others saw it. We just saw it in this particular way. So to summarize up to now, phosphate acquisition by cyanobacteria can be very fast. Its uptake is decoupled from growth. And there is some kind of large intermediate pool, which is most probably not the intracellular phosphate renders. So where do marine bacteria accumulate phosphate? I show you again the one-step model of phosphate uptake. And when we look at it, we say, okay, it can probably be inside as dissolved phosphate or in forms of nucleotides, ATP, other nucleotides. It can be incorporated into macromolecules like DNA, uh, ribosomal RNA, but prochlorococcus are too small to have uh, polyphosphate granules intracellularly, so this probably is not the case, but phosphate can be bound extracellularly to lipopolysaccharides, to S layer, as it was proposed for archaea. Some extracellular macromolecules could probably be temporarily phosphorylated and then dephosphorylated and then phosphate could be taken up. I do not know where the energy comes from, but who knows? The periplasm can carry some phosphate PSTS subunits. The subunits of the transporter could probably bind some of the phosphate and carry them and release them only later, probably. But to answer these questions, we had to have a model system because it's very tricky to work with oceanic bacteria. We know how to work with oceanic cyanobacteria, but still for the experiments we were uh, planning in our head, we had to have a model system. So we looked again at our uh, bacterial plankton, the dominant populations. Prochlorococcus is tricky to work. Whoever tried the uh, nose, but Cynococcus is a good model, we decided, because many Cynococcuses are cultured as the Xenic cultures in the lab. Their genomes are sequenced and annotated. It grows well, it tolerates manipulations, and it does control 7% of phosphate in the gyre, while its relative percentage is lower than 1%. So it seems to store phosphate all right, similarly to other bacteria. The problem with Cynococcus is that it does accumulate intracellular polyphosphates. So we had to be careful about this. We took three axenic strains to work with. Two of them are adapted to oligotrophic ocean, the WH will call 8102 and 8109. The one is literally adapted to low phosphorus conditions. And the second one belongs to the clade, which is dominant in the subtropical ocean. And the third one, the 7803, is the opportunistic strain, which accumulates polyphosphates readily, grows crazily, and very handy to work with, but probably behaves differently. So we decided we'll, we'll look at it and compare it to the oligotrophic strains. First of all, what we did, we said, okay, can they take phosphate rapidly and, uh, and uh, with very high efficiency? We took the cells, washed them with the artificial seawater, trying to remove the extracellular phosphate, and then put them in artificial seawater with no phosphate inside, spike the culture with tracer-free phosphate labeled with 30-second isotope, incubated in light for 2 to 20 hours, and then filtered gen gently the cells and measured how much radioactivity, radioactivity remained in the solution. And to my surprise, when I was doing these experiments, it was a bit strange. We work with phosphate 32. Geiger has high efficiency in detecting it. it. It screams at you. And then you filter the cells out. Cells are hot. You measure the medium left behind. Nothing. You put it in the scintillation counter. Guys, it's background. Nothing. Six CPM. Almost nothing. They took within two to 12 uh, hours everything we could not detect, it was below our detection. Only here, when the concentration of cells was a bit lower, we had some remains, but cyanococcus can take all phosphate from the medium that we can detect with scintillation counting. 
we calculated that they depleted the amidium to 10 to the minus 15 molar, which is femtomolar, which is crazy. But that's good. Our model system knows to take phosphate from the liquid efficiently. The second thing that we were trying to see is whether they accumulate, cyanococcus accumulate phosphate in their cells, and where do they do this? So we did pulse chase experiment, as I showed you in the beginning, and it worked. I want to show it here. We went to something a bit more sophisticated. We started thinking, okay, they accumulate phosphate, but where? This is the whole live cells. You have labile phosphate in the cytoplasm, you have phosphate in nucleic acids, you have some phosphate in periplasm, you have probably some phosphate adsorbed to the surface, you have polyphosphates and you have phospholipids. How do we divide these two parcels to see if we remove some of them, if the pool is removed, then okay, it's in this cell. So we started fixing cells. The first fixation was with paraformaldehyde and like other aldehydes, Paraformaldehyde crosslinks in between amino groups. So it creates a scaffolding of micro macromolecules, but compromises the membranes. So what happens is that all the solutes leak. So if you have phosphate in the cytoplasm, it should leak here. Also small molecules like um, tRNAs and uh, some mRNAs and uh, nucleotides, uh, things like this would probably leave too. It does leave large uh, nucleic acid molecules because they are trapped in this scaffold of cross-linked proteins. It also traps proteins themselves in between membrane layers, but phospholipids can be lost. And then the second fixation that we applied was the precipitation of nucleic acids with trichloroacetic acids. So nucleic acids and maybe some phospholipids are precipitated here and the rest is gone. We took cells, washed them, spiked them with radioactive phosphate, and incubated them for two or four hours. Then we took the cells, tested how much is in live cells, how much is in PFA fixed cells, micromolecules, and how much is in nucleic acids. And here are the results for these three strains. And you see clearly that this difference in between the macromolecules and the live cells is the difference that shows you the intermediate buffer. It's somewhere inside the cell, but not in macromolecules yet, and not in DNA or nucleic acids at all. And with time, this difference goes down. I have to mention here that cells are washed here with artificial seawater. So whatever is missing, up to 100, is washed by the wash, so it was outside. Some phosphate is bound extracellularly, but in addition to this, there is this pool. Then we did another experiment. We labeled cells for two hours with radioactive phosphate. Then while they are still alive, we washed the radioactive phosphate away, suspended the cells in artificial seawater containing cold phosphate only, sort of a chase, but more complicated. And then we fixed cells or tested cells after one hour and 19 hours to see what happens to the label. So in live cells, the gray bars label was not lost it was retained by the cells, but more and more of radioactive label was incorporated into macromolecules in red and DNA molecules or nucleic acids in blue over time. In this strain, all phosphate which cell had became macromolecules. And here this went down and we think this is because of polyphosphates. So the accumulated phosphate is labile because it can be incorporated into macromolecules over time. So it remains accessible for assimilation. It still doesn't tell us where it is. So it's not in the PFA fixed macromolecules. It's not in the nucleic acid uh, precipitated with trichloroacetic acid. It's somewhere else. Where can it be? I said some of it was bound to the surface. Probably it's the surface. Let's look at the surface. What do we have at the surface? We have an S layer. Let's deplete the medium of calcium. Let's add EDTA. This destabilizes the S layer, which is a scaffold of proteins which are bound together with electrostatic interactions. If you remove cations, these interactions break down and S layer is at least partially shed. Electrostatic association further, let's wash the cells with basic or acidic solutions. Let's add lysozyme, which in addition to the glycan, it also, also destabilizes uh, lipopolysaccharides. Let's add protein ASK. Let's destroy the S layer completely and other extracellular proteins which are peeping out from the cell. Let's destroy them. 
let's add alkaline phosphatase and dephosphorylate whatever can be phosphorylated. Let's add detergents, pleuronic, triton. Let's destabilize the phospholipids. If there are any inclusions, let's do it all. And I did. And I show you the percentage of removal of the label in live cells. That much is removed when cells are washed with artificial seawater. And these are all my treatments. Probably by mistake or in desperation, I do not know how this happened. I washed the cells with just distilled water, 40% removal. Okay, distilled water, but not only distilled water. In addition to distilled water, if you wash your cells with PBS, phosphate buffer saline, which is full of phosphate, you remove your radioactive label. Even if you wash it with artificial seawater diluted more than one to three with distilled water, you wash this extra buffer away. So it's something to do with osmolarity. Here are the results for the three strains, water in white, PBS in turkeys, and you see that water in turkeys and the two oligotrophic strains removes as much phosphate as the PFA fixation does. Okay, so it's something to do with hypotonic wash. Would I just slice the cells and then everything leaks out? Though we know it's not the case, but still, we took 8102, one of the strains, and incubated it with distilled water for half an hour. Cyanobacteria or shining cyanobacteria are amazing. They do not pop. You look at them under a microscope, they are intact. And these are the results from uh, flow cytometry. We looked at, this, at the cell site scatter, green fluorescence and orange fluorescence, and how the cells look when they are alive and healthy and compared it to the, to the uh, cells which were incubated in uh, distilled water for half an hour. And it's not much difference. Orange fluorescence does go up, green fluorescence does go up, the side doesn't change, and debris here are negligible because this is less than 0.1% of all cells which become degrees, which mean lies. So based on flow cytometry, the bulk of the cells remain intact. And to keep the story short, I just found a publication which said that osmotic shock releases the periplasmic content in gram-negative bacteria. I decided, okay, I need to look for a signal coming from periplasm and another signal coming from the cytoplasm and to see if I have both signals when I do the treatment with distilled water, then I lyse cells and also release the periplasm, I have two. But if I have a signal coming only from periplasm and nothing from cytoplasm, then probably the water treatment releases the periplasm content only. And what I did, I starved cyanococcus for phosphorus, upregulating the expression of PSTS subunit of a phosphate transporter. And then I pelleted the cells. I resuspended them in five milliliters of distilled water for one minute. This is our osmotic shock. I pelleted the cells again, collected the supinatant. This is my wash. This is what I wash out of cells with the distilled water. I pelleted the cells again, resuspended them again in five mil in the same volume of distilled water, but now I lyse them using a sonication. And then I run uh, the protein gel, adding increasing volumes of a cell lysate, the distilled water wash fraction and membranes, 5, 10, 20 microliters. And I did Western with antibodies against the PSTS and Rubisco. Rubisco is my intracellular marker and PSTS is my periplasmic marker. And you see, though faintly, that I had the signal for PSTS. And though the amount of Rubisco in lyse cells was huge, I had no signal of Rubisco in my um, water wash fraction, which confirmed basically that my hypotonic wash removes the contact of periplasm and not of the cytoplasm. So phosphorus is probably in the periplasm. And here I show you the results of pulse chase. You are familiar with the red part. Red part is fixed cells which accumulate radioactive phosphate during the pulse period and then continue accumulating it despite of the chase. When we look at the whole cells, this is the area, all area shaded in yellow and red. Live cells accumulate radioactive phosphate during the pulse period, but then they stop accumulating it when we chase it. And this is perfectly fine. And when we do it with water, water removes most of the label accumulated in live cells and not in macromolecules. This labile pool is five to 10 times larger when the amount of phosphorus assimilated into cellular macromolecules 
and accumulation of phosphate is not halted by the chase, as I showed you before. So the picture is intact. And this corresponds to the result that phosphate accumulation and assimilation growth, they are decoupled. Oh, cell accumulate and assimilates it's much more phosphorus than it needs at that point of time. Then we wanted to close the last point. What power is phosphate accumulation in periplasm? Some of you may know that the source of energy in periplasm is problematic. There is no ATP. How do they accumulate it? And so rapidly and so efficiently. Remember, nothing was left in artificial seawater. How do they do that? And in cyanobacteria, like in many other organisms, when we say powers, bioenergy, we use inhibitors. And we use inhibitors too. We use DCMU, which partially inhibits light-dependent membrane polarization. And by doing this, reduces ATP generation. We use DCCD, which directly inhibits ATP generation and thereby depolarizes membranes. We use DBMIB, which directly inhibits electron transport dependent membrane polarization and only thereby inhibits ATP generation. And we use CCCP, which is a decoupler that directly depolarizes membranes and thereby inhibits ATP generation. We did it in our oceanic cyanobacteria during the cruise. Oh, it was actually not cyanobacteria. Most of them are cyanobacteria, but it's the total bacterial plankton population. In gray, you see accumulation of radioactive label in the control cells. In pink, these are cells treated with DCMU. Some of them are not cyanobacteria, they are not sensitive. And you see that there is accumulation just at a slower rate. But then when we add the other three inhibitors, DCCD, DBMIB, and CCCP, there is no progress. The accumulation stops, and that's it. And it stops less severe in DCCD and more severe in other two inhibitors. Based on these results, we could calculate how long does it take for the inhibitor to completely halt phosphate uptake. For DCCD, it was something slightly above 10 minutes. The scale here is logarithmic. And for other two, it was something around four minutes to stop taking phosphate up into live cells, and even less, less so to stop taking phosphate into the mole. And we did the same experiments with our three strains. I won't show you all the steps. I just show you the final conclusion when we calculated the time, the time that which took CCCP to halt phosphate uptake in all three strains is about four minutes and less so for uptake into macromolecules and incorporation into nucleic acids. So it seems that our results in the ocean and in culture correspond very well, that CCCP, the decoupler, is the fastest, which helps the accumulation of phosphate within four minutes. So proton motive force is crucial for periplasmic phosphate accumulation. And we decided that this is proton motive force and not ATP generation per se, because the DCCD inhibitor, which first inhibits ATP generation and only then depolarizes membranes, it's less efficient. It takes more than 10 minutes for it to stop phosphate accumulation as compared to inhibitors, which first depolarize membranes and only then halt ATP. Proton motive force has two compartments. It has the delta pH, the chemical gradient sustained by protons during respiration and photosynthesis. Protons are shuffled outside the plasma membrane into the periplasm and accumulate there. So the pH in the periplasm is lower onto this. And there is a gradient that forces protons to return inside the cell on the way they rotate the turbine. And uh, this work is used to phosphorylate ADP to produce ATP. And then there are also antiporters, which can take protons in and instead of them to push sodium out. And sodium then can be taken up and potassium is then pushed out. And this is how you sustain the second part of the PMT of the proton motive force, the electrical gradient, which is sustained by ions other than proton, for example, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc. CCCP dissipates both because it equilibrates the concentration of protons and then there is no gradient and other ions equilibrate too. But you have other inhibitors which equilibrate concentrations of, for example, potassium or just monocations or decations such as calcium and magnesium and again CCCP. And when we did these experiments trying to see which compartment, the chemical gradient of protons or the electrical gradients of other cations is important for phosphate uptake, we saw that CCCP 
the disruption of proton maintained gradient reduces the phosphate uptake the harshest. So other cations are less in play. The criticism on inhibitors is always that some inhibitors are not working as expected, they have side effects. What is opposite to inhibition? Stimulation. So we try to see if we can stimulate the PMT, we can increase it and receive higher phosphate accumulation. Fortunately, in cyanobacteria, we can stimulate protomotive force by exposing them to light. We did it in the ocean. We compared phosphate uptake in uh, cells of Prochlorococcus, Cyanococcus. These cells were sorted by, one by one. So we know that this is for Prochlorococcus, Cyanococcus, and SAR11 alpha proteobacteria, which, by the way, also uses sunlight in dark versus light. And if the uptake in the dark and in the light are the same, you expect the rates to fall on the unity line. But you see that most of the results fall to the right of the unity line towards the light. So light stimulates uptake of phosphate, which again suggests that uh, proton motive force is essential and plays a crucial part in phosphate uptake. I want to summarize our findings. So we know that labile phosphate, which is taking up very quickly and can be removed from cells because it's not incorporated into their macromolecules, is in periplasm. It is actively accumulated in periplasm and then it's gradually assimilated into cellular macromolecules. And the rate of phosphate accumulation in the periplasm is much higher compared to the rate of assimilation. So there is a buffer. It goes into periplasm very fast, stays here, and then tip in, tip in, gradually it's taking into the cell and is incorporated into macromolecules. It can be five to 40 times larger than the content of phosphate in macromolecules. Though diffusion of the solute through a porin requires steep solute gradient, remember it's a passive step. When phosphate goes through a porin, it's a passive step. So it needs to rely on a gradient. More phosphate outside, less phosphate inside the periplasm. We know that at C, concentrations of phosphate go down to 10 to the minus 10. And in culture, cells repleted phosphate from artificial seawater down to 10 to the minus 15 molar. So somehow it goes against the gradient, probably. Accumulation of phosphate in periplasm can be halted by abolishing the proton motive force and can be stimulated by light. All these results contradict the current one-step process model. So a new model needs to be presented. And this is the first attempt. We said, OK, can PSTS hold all this phosphate and then slowly release it inside the cell? Probably. Every time PSTS meets a phosphate molecule, it keeps it, and then it brings it to the intracellular membrane, and it goes in. The known affinity of PSTS to phosphate molecule was deciphered for Pseudomonas, and it's 10 to the minus 7. It doesn't sound right, but still, could it be? We calculated the volume of periplasm in Cyanococcus. We calculated the volume of a single PSTS molecule. Fortunately, it is available. And we calculated how much space do we need in order to pack inside the periplasm all these PSTS molecules holding to a phosphate, because we know how much phosphate is taking up and is hold in the buffer. And the number was 17 times more of space was required than was available in the periplasm. And this is before we took into account 41 other ABC type transporters and some other transporters, the uh, tripartite that were presented here before. And in Prochlorococcus, which has the same uh, amount of transport and enzymes, but smaller periplasm, it can accumulate even more phosphate. So this model didn't explain our observations. So we opted for pure speculation. I'll show you here the results from uh, 1976 from the paper in chemistry, which shows you the distribution of phosphate anions in seawater. The major anion is HPO4 2 minus. When it comes into a periplasm, pH in the periplasm is lower because of the protons which are extruded in there. So normally it protonates. It probably also binds metal cations present in the periplasm. Remember the second part of the PMT? Calcium and magnesium form insoluble salts when they associate with phosphate. So probably calcium and magnesium are not so much in play in the periplasm. And these are only our thoughts. We haven't showed anything of this, but we know that periplasm is free of insoluble salts. So we assume that this is the case. So what is left is sodium and potassium. They are available in periplasm. They can associate with phosphate ions. 
And then the concentration of the free ion inside the periplasm is actually very low. It sustains the gradient and more and more ions can enter the periplasm from outside. These cation paired phosphate molecules, they, they remain accessible to PSTS. So PSTS probably has higher affinity for phosphate and can bind and dissociate from sodium and potassium ions. And then these phosphate can diffuse inside and be taken out. This is our two-step model. None of this has been shown directly, and we are working on it to show you the next steps. What I just wanted to mention is that it's probably easier to explain it if I tell you that the cell in the periplasm has its phosphate buffer. When you prepare your phosphate buffer, well, some of us who are older, when they prepare their phosphate buffer, they mix sodium and potassium salts of phosphate, monophosphate, diphosphate. And this is what the cells have around it. Probably this is why phosphate buffer is what we use for most of applications in physiology and other cells. We still do not know. But if it's true, we have a few explanations for phenomena we know from uh, our laboratory life. The results and explanations can be found in the paper published two years ago in Nature Communication. And I just want to acknowledge the professor I was doing this work with, uh, Professor Mike Zubko from the Scottish Association of Marine Science from the UK, and Dave Scanlon from uh, Financial Support from University of Warwick. My colleagues from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who helped me with some uh, Westerns and with whom I had the uh, discussions, and thank you for your attention, and I'm sure you have some questions now.